to the Poplar Springs Christian Church. Poplar Springs is located 6115 Old Stage Road in Raleigh. We invite you to come to go with us to a service already in progress. And may the Lord bless you throughout this service. Praise the Lord, Poplar Springs. It's time to lift up the name of Jesus one more time. We invite you to join in with us wherever you are, in your home, in your car, on your job. Just praise the Lord with us. Come on, put your hands together like this. The song goes like this. Jehovah, you, I trust in you. Oh, Lord, Jehovah, you, I trust in you. I believe, I believe you. I trust in you.
say bye bye. Goodbye, goodbye, say bye bye. Goodbye, goodbye, say bye bye. Goodbye, depression. we know we can go to the rock because we know he's able where do i go when there's nobody else to turn to who do i talk to when nobody wants to listen who do i lean on when there's no foundation stable, I go to the rock. I go to the rock. I know he's able. I go to the rock. Hallelujah, we can run to the rock, the stone that the builders rejected. 
Let's approach the throne of grace. Spirit of the living God, we thank you, God, for everything that you have done. God, we thank you for how you have brought us over a mighty long way. And God, even as we are, are, are recognizing Black History Month, God, we thank you, God, for being the God, not just of now, but even the God of our ancestors who have brought us over a mighty, mighty long way. God, we thank you for how you have, have, have sustained us and, and how you have kept us even in the face of injustice and, and even in the face of racism. God, we thank you for your strength that has kept us as, as we have marched through the streets and as, as we have sat, sit, sat down at, at lunch counters and as we have taken seats on buses. God, we thank you for how you have kept us for how we have gathered and, and by the millions on and on the Capitol Mall and how we have protested and, and how we have gone in the streets. And God, we thank you that even in the face of current police brutality, God, with the deaths that are being broadcasted on national TV, God, we came to say that we know that you are still keeping us and that you are still the rock, that you are still our foundation. And God, we're coming and turning to you you now and saying that God we know that you're still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that our ancestors and us can think and God if you have done it before we know that you're able to do it again so all the people of God say do it again God do it again make ways out of no ways God do it again God open doors that have been shut in our face do it again God heal bodies like never before do it again God because you know that you're the same God yesterday the same God today and you'll be the same God forever for grace and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and we'll give you all the glory all the honor all the praise because it is yours in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray all the people say amen 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 somebody give God praise right here The Harlem Hellfighters was a regiment of New York National Guardsmen in the First World War. They were set up to fail by their own government. They were humiliated, degraded, uh, eventually given to the French army as a throwaway. And they ended up coming home as one of the most decorated units in the entire U.S. Army. The Harlem Hellfighters are one of the most important regiments in American history. In World War I, they helped to establish to the entire world the power of black soldiers in the military. It was very difficult at that time for African Americans to get into the United States military because there was this perception that African Americans would not do well in battle. They had to overcome the prejudice of their own countrymen and yet also perform ably on the battlefield. Like so many units of African American descent, when they go overseas, they're not sure what they're gonna do. Are they gonna fight as infantry? Or are they gonna be stevedores and load ships? Or are they gonna be labor units and cut wood? And so they're committed to labor duty, they're unloading ships, building latrines, those type of support services. And as you can imagine, these men have been trained and they're willing to fight, they're ready to fight, and this is stressful for them. They were finally given to the French Army, which in a way was an even greater insult because in the First World War, when the United States entered, General Pershing, the commanding officer, was very clear that American forces would not be fed piecemeal into the French and British Army because the French and British wanted reinforcements. And Pershing said, absolutely not. When Americans join this war, they will fight as an American force under an American flag led by an American general dot, 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 except for the black guys. You can have them. Henry Johnson is perhaps one of the most remarkable black military heroes in US history. And he found himself in no man's land with Private Needham Roberts manning a listening post. And Needham Roberts hears, click, click, click. And he realizes somebody's cutting the wire. It's potentially a German raid. And so Roberts is passing him grenades, and they line up these grenades. And the Germans actually do come across the lines. 
Roberts is hurt, and now Henry Johnson is left to defend their position and to stave off this attack. And then he makes the mistake of jamming a French cartridge into his American gun, and it no longer will work. And the Germans are on top of it. He then used his rifle like a club, and then he ended up fighting with a knife against the Kaiser's best and turned them. He's wounded in the fray. He's struck, for example, in the foot um, and has a debilitating injury as a result. And he fights them off, he says, for what seemed like an hour. The Germans ran shrieking into the night, all because of one man. It's not until the next morning that people realize what a tremendous act this was. They discover four bodies of dead German soldiers. And they also realize from the equipment and other things that are left behind that as many as 30 may have been involved in this altercation. As soon as he drove off those Germans, the French awarded him with the Croix de Guerre, a great honor. Unfortunately, it took about 75 years for the US government to give him the Legion of Merit. Had he been white, he would have walked out of that war with the Medal of Honor. What was so shocking to me when I began to research the story of the Hellfighters was that after they had performed so magnificently in combat, the United States government actually sent a memorandum to the French government, essentially implementing Jim Crow essentially saying, don't give them some notion that they are equals, because we don't want them taking that notion back to the United States and demanding equality. When he come back to the United States, he's not awarded the Purple Heart. There's no notation in his military record of his injury. And so he winds up not being able to work because of this injury. He doesn't get any kind of assistance from the, from the army or from the government as a result. And he ends up dying in 1929 penniless. So it again shows the paradox. Here's this great story of valor and of courage on the part of the soldier. And ultimately, he comes back to a nation that doesn't honor that sacrifice. We tend to think we all know American history so well, but the story of the Harlem Hellfighters should be one of the first stories told. It wasn't about killing other people. It was about being Americans and serving their country well. That was the inclination of the Harlem Hellfighters. When you are African-American in 1917, democracy is armor, democracy is a weapon. And to fight for a war to make the world safe for democracy was something more than just some ethereal crusade for the Hellfighters. It had concrete results. They were fighting for the rights to be a citizen of the country that they were born in. Once again, good morning, Poplar Springs, and welcome to this last Sunday of February, our last month, our last Sunday in the month of February of celebrating black history. I hope you enjoyed the presentations a little before the sermon on the hell fighting soldiers. This morning, we close out with Ephesians 4. We have been in Ephesians 4 since the beginning of the year. And so this morning, our focus is between verses 27 and 40, 32. Ephesians 4, 27 through 40, uh, 32. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, to the use of edifying that it may minister grace <clears throat> unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Yes. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking 
speaking be put away from you with all malice. Amen. Amen. And amen. I want to speak on the second part of a soldier's duty. Let us pray. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For God, you are our strength and our redeemer. Speak, Lord. Amen. A soldier's duty. Once again, I want to share with you our key verse, verse 27, the same as last week. Neither give place to the devil. On that last Sunday, this last Sunday of Black History Observance, I want to give this sermon, Strength in Unity, part six of the series. I want to focus on another event in black history. Today's sermon, A Soldier's Duty, can be found in that illustration. In this conclusion of strength in unity, there is a story of our past. In World War I, there were a group of African American men who made up what was called the 369th Regiment, a regiment of the United States military. They were from New York. And before being engaged into combat, they were the National Guard for New York. But when they were in World War II, they fought in Germany. And it was the German soldiers who gave them the name, the Harlem Hell Fighters. <clears throat> they were considered, listen now, they were considered to be a trial unit, a trial regiment, just like their African-American brothers called the Tuskegee Airmen, who fought in World War II after them. The years would be 1914 to 1918. And during this time in history, black men were not considered good enough to be good soldiers. They, at first, decided that they didn't want these men on the battlefield because they would fail. And they tried to send them to the French to fight along with the French. But the French says, no, we don't want them. You keep them, they said, or send them somewhere else. However, these black boys, these black men, these black brothers proved everybody <coughs> wrong. The Germans gave them the name Hellfighters because the Germans had to tangle with them. And you tangling with somebody that whips up on you, you have a whole lot more respect for them. Some of us do. The Germans said they were Hellfighters because they never gave up. Did you hear that? They never <clears throat> gave up. They were relentless, the Germans said. 
these men were <clears throat> courageous and they were brave. Everyone thought those boys would not do well, but when they came home, they were the most decorated soldiers in World War I. They even got to march in the parade down the street in New York City. But when it came time for their own government, the United States government, to honor them, it was held back. Because the powers to be, listen to this, the powers to be said if they think they are valuable, then they might start asking for their rights. It was said that they must be kept in their place. Although they fooled us, and they turned out to be pretty good soldiers, we can't celebrate them because then they would want to be like us. And so when the soldiers came back, they came back to Jim Crow. They came back to segregation. They came back to racism. They came back to second class citizenship and it would take the United States government 97 years to honor these men do the math that puts us somewhere around 2015 the question this morning is how can a man fight for a country that refuses to honor him and his contribution that helped the country secure victory. How can a Christian soldier fight for a Christian soldier who is not willing to fight for them? It's disheartening, isn't it? Last summer was so heartbreaking for me, even in the midst of a pandemic. Yes, I was fighting prostate cancer, but that wasn't it. I was fighting the being at home and felt like we were in a cage, but, but that wasn't it. What broke my heart was to listen to citizens of this country, wrongly, wrongly brand the Black Lives Matter movement. And all during this time, the conservative pulpits were silent. It broke my heart. It deteriorated my faith in my fellow Christians, both who were black and white conservatives. They made many attempts to justify the protests in Washington, D.C. on January 6th of this year as being the same type of protests in the summer of 2020. And to put the icing on the cake, we heard the rhetoric from the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, and his insensitive allies. We heard them rally against the nation in the name of love for their country. The bottom line is, even after 1914, we are still fighting. Even after World War I 
and the historic achievements of the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II, we are still fighting. The question is, how can we do it? How can we continue after disappointment, after disappointment, after disappointment? I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you how. As a good soldier, we must know our duty. That's what I want to talk about. There is strength in unity when a soldier knows and exercises his duty. Before all of the shooting starts, a soldier has to know their specific duty in the unit. In order for the unit to become mighty and strong, every soldier has a specific duty to that goal. And the same thing applies with the church. Everybody has a specific duty to help the church meet its goal. Everybody can't sing. God knows everybody can't sing. Everybody can't play the instruments. God knows everybody can't do that. Everybody can't manage the money. <coughs> Somebody ought to say amen. <coughs> In order for there to be strength in unity, everybody has to know what their specific duty is and to follow through their duty to be good soldiers. And being good soldiers brings about strength, which comes from our unity. Look at our key verse again. How do we achieve that unity? Verse 27 says, Neither give place to the devil. I chose two Sundays to talk about that verse because it's so important and so instrumental. Church, I'm saying to you, how do we unite the body? How do we unite the body of Christ in the modern 21st century church? How do we unite the body of Christ after all we have gone through? How do we do it? In order to gain strength, to fight, and to win victoriously, the Apostle Paul teaches the church of Ephesus. And in these last four verses of Ephesians 4, he speaks, listen. Give no place. Can you say that? Give no place to the devil. Everyone must work to that end. In uh, this leading verse of our text, here is what Paul wants us to know. Neither give place to the devil. Your duty is to understand something. And that duty is everybody must work. You might not can sing like Silas or preach like Paul, but you still have a responsibility. Everybody must work. I come to discover at the age of 61, I've learned something. I've learned a whole lot. I've learned that a struggle might just turn out to be a blessing. Some people don't want to work simply because of the fears that they have. Some people don't want to work because they fear they don't have the know-how or they're going to say something or do something wrong and embarrass themselves. I say to you this morning, don't give the devil space. Because the God who is loving, he's already got your back. Anybody believe that today? <laughs> He's already got your back. And if you fall, I want you to know you won't be the first one to fall. Amen. If you make a mistake, you won't be the first one to make a mistake. A struggle helps keep the devil out. It's good for people to struggle every now and then. And therefore, Paul says it is every Christian's duty, every soldier's duty to work 
for what they have. Amen. You don't have to steal. You don't have to steal, Paul tells them. He tells the Christian soldiers, you don't have to take a man's money. You don't have to steal his dignity. You don't have to take his property. You don't have to rob him of his strength. Paul tells us in verse 28, listen carefully. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. Can you say work? Let him labor working with his hands, the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Did y'all hear that? Everybody ought to say amen. Everybody understand that there is our duty right there. Everybody don't have hands to work, preach Charles Brooks. Everybody don't have the skills to do what you can do, but God has blessed you with it with a purpose, not so that you can just sit back and brag about it and say, look what I have. Put that verse back up again. That verse clearly tells us that he gave it to us that we might be able to give to him that needed. Did y'all see that? God loves it when we understand our duty and our responsibility. God blesses a whole lot of us, but we don't want to share that blessing with one another. Somebody ought to say amen. The church is empowered through your giving. The church is empowered not only through your financial giving, but through your giving of work. Everybody must work in order for this regiment to be what God would have it to be. Let's go to verse 29. Verse 29 says, let, this is the second thing, let no communications proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of edifying. Hmm. Let the communications that come from your mouth be communications to edify, not to put down, not to disgrace, not to humiliate, not to talk about somebody, not to destroy somebody, but if we're going to be a strong body in Christ here at Poplar Springs, we must not let corrupt communications come out of our mouth. <coughs> but what comes out of our mouth ought to be that which is good and edifying. You ought to lift somebody up. You ought to encourage somebody. You ought to tell somebody not only how good they look, but you tell them how good they are. You tell them how you watch them and how they struggle, but how they overcome. Give them some encouragement. That brings about our unity because that is every Christian's duty. The next thing in verse 30, listen to what it says. And grieve not the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. I imagine God grieves at a whole lot of things we do. But I'm here to tell you the thing that God grieves at the most is when we don't help our brothers and sisters, when he has empowered us to do so. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, Paul says, because you have a Christian duty not only not to, dis not to grieve the Holy Spirit, but to help somebody along the way. You might worry about how am I going to survive if I'm helping everybody else. Paul tells us in that 30th verse, let me read it to you again. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. God has blessed you. God will continue to bless you. God will continue to keep you up and you will never give out. You will never run dry because you are sealed unto the day of redemption. God has taken care of you. Let the church say amen. And then there is another lesson, a fourth lesson, verse 31, listen. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor 
and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. What is he saying to us? He's saying, let all bitterness, let all anger, let all wrath, let all trouble, evil speaking, don't let me find you doing that. If there is someone who has made you bitter, then you have to learn how to forgive. You have to learn how to let anger go. There are people out in the cemetery right now who have been there a long time, and when they died, they died because they were angry with someone they could not forgive. Is that you today? Have you given devil to the room, given room to the devil with your thoughts? Have the devil robbed you of your joy and you can't even praise God, not only in church, but at home? Because you're so full of bitterness. You're so full of anger and wrath. Paul says, put it away. That's your duty, to put it away. Put away malice, put away evil speaking, put away all of those things and learn how to forgive one another in love. And finally, there is verse 32. Verse 32 simply says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. This sums it all up, the whole series of how we have strength in unity. The verse opens with be kind to one another. Amen. To be tenderhearted and forgiving of one another, even, listen now, even as God have forgiven you. It's easy to remember God has forgiven me, but it's not easy to remember that God wants me to forgive those who trespass against me. If we are to have strength, Poplar Springs, if we are to have unity, then everybody here you have a duty as a soldier in this army to never allow space to the devil. Wherever you are, whatever you come against, whatever your situation is, never allow Satan to tear up your marriage, to tear up your home, to tear up your praise, to tear up your life, to tear up your finances, never allow Satan any space. That's a soldier's duty. And if we all practice that, we will have unity and we will be strong. We will be able to do what God empowers us to do. Strength in unity. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for this long series that started at the first Sunday of the year. And it is my prayer that people have heard your word and they are now ready to put on the new man. They are now ready to have their minds renewed. I pray, oh God, that you will touch right now. I pray that you would heal. I pray that you would forgive. But most of all, as a congregation and as a ministry, empower us. Make our unity strong. Make our love for one another strong. And give us the strength and the power to fight the enemy. Give us the power to resist the devil. Flee from him and he'll flee from us. Thank you, Lord, for this series. Thank you for keeping us during this pandemic. 
And as we plunge into 2021, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. And I pray that this series might have helped you or at least have set the course for the church for 2021. Keep Ephesians 4. Read it weekly. Read it daily. Because it has our marching orders in this war to be united in love, to be united in strength, to be united in power. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Pray for your brothers. Pray for your sisters. Pray for one another. And most of all, pray for your preaching. Have a great week. We worship the Lord because of who he is. He's our strength, he's our peace, he's our comfort, he's our friend, and he is our way maker. You are
for joining us here at Poplar Springs Christian Church. We hope that you did enjoy the worship service. We invite you to give to the ministry of Poplar Springs as your gifts empower us to do what we do. Poplar Springs serve the surrounding community of Raleigh and Wake County. You may give through Tidely. You will find that app on our webpage as well as PayPal or you can mail it to us at 6115 Old Stage Road, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27603. Feel free to give us a call. We would love to hear from you at area code 919-772-5151. We would like to remind everybody to always remember to stay safe and follow the CDC guidelines. Poplar Springs is offering for a small price purchases of our logo face mask. They come in blue and gray. Please write the church or call the church and inquire about these face masks. We want you to know that Poplar Springs is preparing for a reopening sometimes later in the year. Our staff have been working very hard to bring you back. God bless you, have a great week, and we hope to see you next week here 
the same place, same time.